time. A lot of them go over to the town committee for running charters. Um, so the crosses indicates the pens that we've got. So we've got some pens up here and pens over here. Um, so um, they're, you know, they're doing what they can to help us on that side. Look, at the end of the day, they've said they're going to leave it to us to work out the pen allocation because they said you know, they know some boats don't like to lie alongside other boats and they'd rather leave that sort of, uh, those sort of issues to us. Um, but at the moment, we reckon we can just get 40 boats in. Um, that is going to be the limit. So um, if we get any more boats, then we'll be pleased to accept them. Uh, but then we'll have to move to, um, to Plan B um, in terms of the, um, what I, I'll show the picture next slide, in terms of what I would call the southern arm of the uh, canal development. And uh, this is the, um, so this is the harbour in here. Um, there are bridges which cut off um, most of the canal development. Um, but this section in here um, is charted as having uh, two metres of, um, of water. Uh, that's a that chart datum. So, uh, and during the week we're there, there's a minimum tide of 0.5 of a metre. So there should be two and a half metres uh, down those arms. And that's probably plan B if we end up with an overflow in the, uh, in the main marina because um, it's, the commercial wharf is, uh, well, the industrial wharf is pretty big and it's not really suitable for lying alongside. Um, down in this region, um, the sort of housing development down here, there's a whole lot of uh, wharfs that were built on spec before they built the house, and the house has never been built, so there's some wharfs down there. Um, I don't know if anybody else, I've rented a house down at this end and it's got a wharf out the front of it, so um, we can raft some boats up down there. So that's, that's our plan B if we, uh, if we need to. But, um, but the key message is DOT are really keen to see us up there. They're going to really do everything they can to uh, fit us all into the marina. Uh, they have a project, uh, just as an example, they have a project um, um, which is to put some uh, picnic shades and facilities here. Um, they've brought forward that project by um, three months in order to have it all finished by the time we, uh, by the time we come up there. So, um, yeah, DOT couldn't be more helpful. Uh, um, just the last thing on the berthing. Um, DOT and Exmouth uh, seem to be very concerned about compliance and having forms filled out and um, they will be needing for each boat a um, insurance, proof of insurance, which you've got to do anyway, a gas certificate and an electrical certificate. Uh, we've got a bit of clarification about the electrical certificate. Um, essentially, if you, if you don't have um, 240 volt wiring on your boat, um, you don't need to have an electrical certificate. So if all you do is run a power cord onto your boat and you use that for a dehumidifier or, you know, perhaps a battery charger or something like that, you don't need an electrical certificate. But if you do have 240-volt wiring in your boat and you intend to connect to shore power, you must have a, um, some, some electrical certificate. They've got specific requirements. It's all, it's all on their website. Um, and the last comment is that um, they were very clear that there must be a safety tag on all uh, power cables to say they're compliant. Um, last thing is that all this, these requirements are all a part of Top Yacht, so um, when you get, you need to upload documents into uh, Top Yacht, so all the data will be stored in one place, so it should be a fairly painless process once you've got these certificates to um, upload them and then uh, they're, and they're available and we'll be passing those on to, uh, to DOT. So uh, I'll about to pass over to Paul, happy to take any questions, but uh, yeah, as I say, Birthing is not going to be an issue in Exmouth. DOT will really help us out. We've got a contingency plan if, if we need it. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to try and do it without a microphone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Uh, thanks very much for coming along tonight. This is a, a great turnout. Thanks very much um, to the organising committee for having me along. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you um, passage and race planning for this evening. Um, I know that there's uh, 
a much larger contingency of uh, the rally division here tonight. So anyone that's here from the racing division, um, bear with me. This isn't more as, as specific as what we would do with a race uh, presentation because it's a fairly broad net that we're trying to get to. But I'm sure that everybody will find that there's something of some relevance in here. Um, I'm going to break it down into three sections and at the end of each one of those sections I oh, will invite some questions before we move on to the next one um, and then we'll have some time for some questions at the very end. Um, and it's just really so that we can address or answer any questions uh, before we move on to the next bunch of topics. So um, we'll get things underway. Uh, so as an introduction with passive planning, first thing we're going to do is go through some routing. And it doesn't matter if you use computers or if you use maps or charts or anything, everybody should be doing some sort of some sort of routing, routing, whatever you have to pronounce it, and, um, and, and look at some comparisons of, of weather modelling and the configuration of your particular boat. <coughs> From there we'll go into crew management, watch <coughs> systems, some safety equipment, some provisions. And then the third thing we'll go to is some adverse weather, the boat preparation, some storm sails and planning for the unexpected. So passage planning and weather. The most important thing to do first, and what we're trying to do when we do something like this, is we're trying to get as much information as we can. Because the more information you get before you actually start, you can actually do more accurate planning. And that accurate planning is not all about first past the boats, you know, it is for the race boats, but for the rally boats, it will allow yourselves to set yourselves up and configure yourselves uh, for a safe and, uh, and also a, a much more stress-free uh, free journey. So the most important thing for a start is VPP data, that's velocity performance prediction, that, that how fast your boat goes at certain, in certain wind strengths, at certain wind angles, is really important to understand. Because without knowing that, given a day of, of, of X weather, you can't accurately forecast where you're going to be at the end of 5, 10, 12 or 15 hours of planning. How do you get that information? A lot of people know their own boat pretty good. If you, were, if you own a production boat, a, a Bavaria, a Geno, a Beneteau, any, anything that's come out of a factory, there's a 99% chance that you will be able to get your hands on some VPP, data, velocity performance predictions. The, does the person who designed your boat will have a set of boat speed numbers for your boat. So that's the first thing. And then we need to look at adjusting that VPP data, because that's in an ideal world that a boat designer will sit down and they'll do that with their test tank and all their computers and all, all the other, even the pre-computer days would have done it. But you need to adjust it for different sail types and combinations. These days there's some wonderful sails. Some of them work a lot better than others, and they'll make the boat go faster than when the boat was designed, maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago, who knows? The other thing that we need to <coughs> make an adjustment for is the additional weight and the waterline. Like for a long journey like up to Exmouth, we need to make, you know, there, there, there'll be a lot of ice, there'll be a lot of food, there'll be a lot of water, there won't be any grog because we're all sensible. And that will also sink the boat on its waterline and obviously uh, make a difference on how the boat sails. The sea state will, will affect how the boat sails and its efficiency. And also the crew. If the crew are, t are tired or fatigued or, they, or, or anything like that, then they can actually, you know, not, they can slow the boat down. So we need to make sure that the VPP data reflects the sail selection, the weight, the route, and all that sort of stuff can be incorrect. And then the other thing, like I was saying there, 100% of VPP. I know a lot of the race boats are raced like this. You wind your VPP back maybe 90% during the daytime, maybe you know, 85 or 85% during the nighttime. <coughs> Because it's just not possible a lot of the time to have 100% VPP of, you know, um, of the boat's performance. So this is a typical readout from like a Geno Sunfast 32. This is what a designer will do and they'll say, these are the beating angles. So in six knots, the boat will point at 43.5 degrees. And that's true wind angle, the, wind, the angle that the wind actually passes across the centre line of the boat. Most professional sailors and also the only people who talk language of apparent wind angles are moth sailors and America's Cup sailors. So 
<laughs> Unless you're selling an AC72 or a moth to X mount, try and get your numbers in true wind angles. So, um, so basically you can see there all, all the different wind angles of your boat, the different wind strengths, and they're the boat speeds. So if we knew it was going to be uh, 16 knots southwesterly, we're going to be sailing up there at 135, you know the boat will be doing 8.37 knots all day long. Take off a little bit, away you go. So sail selection is really important to know. A lot of people sort of say, I've got one of those, got one of those, got one of those. Where does it fit? You need to find out where this stuff fits and find how the boat performs with it. And it doesn't matter if it's a cruising asymmetric or a code zero or cruising code zero, whatever it is, make sure all these sails. And that also applies to whether your boat's reefed or furled or anything else. You need to understand what the boat's performance is going to be like with all those different setups. And then <clears throat> understanding those sail selections will assist with a dynamic strategy. And it's important to be dynamic with the strategy because if there's absolutely like, not a lot of wind, rather than bobbing around and waiting for it, if you can go faster in another direction, you might be better off doing that because the wind might come in from somewhere else later. You might be like <coughs> making games to sail away from the mark to get towards some more wind. And to do that, you might use a different sail. Having an accurate chart will allow you to go to the next best should you break a sail or if the wind changes. So here's a typical <coughs> sail selection chart, like, say for a Hansa 45. It's like the mainsail might have three reefs and, um, and in zero to 15 knots it'll go to full hoist and the Genoa will be fully deployed in zero to 15 knots. In 15 to 20 knots you might go to furl mark number one on the Genoa and you might go to the first reef in the main. In 20 to 28 knots, you might go to furl mark number two and second reef in the main. And then in 28 to 35 knots, furl mark number three on your jib. And uh, in the third reef in the main, maybe, maybe two, maybe three, that's why they're both shaded there. And from 35 to 50, it'll be the storm jib with the third reef. Similarly with downwind, the true wind angles, which sail, so there's a code zero and assy and then a, a running spinnaker. What they do, what the luff type is, what wind strength they're on, what hand it goes on, what sheet detail. The reason why we do all this sort of stuff is so the crew have got a reference point to go to. Because there's always something that happens. You need to remember, there's nothing worse than being on a race and you've got crew who sort of say, oh, yeah, we've got to put that sail up. We don't know how, where everything goes and how it works. Whereas this sort of takes the pain out from it. So in a very basic sense, if that was laminated and stuck to a boat and given to your crew like now, you'd have enough time to actually mentally rehearse how your different sails work on your boat. On a race boat, it's the same, but we've got a lot more selections. But it's the same thing, and we teach our crews to do all this sort of stuff, and it takes all the errors away. So now we're focusing outside of the boat and then starting to have a look at the weather. Roger Badham who's a very famous meteorologist with America's company. He was our Australian Olympic meteorologist. He always kept saying to us, like, you need to understand the weather of the week. Don't just get to a regard and say, right, what's the weather going to be? Study it a week out. Because then you can sort of say, oh, wow, that, where's that low gone that was here yesterday? It's completely disappeared. Why did that happen? What model still has that low or whatever? So understanding the system of the week, you can start to understand patterns. We need to also understand all models. There are lots of weather models out these days. And let's, a lot of people look for the more commercial, generic things like, oh, I don't use that, I use predict wind. Trust me, the GFS files that predict wind gets are the same as what 10 other providers and software writers will use. It's a GFS, it's an algorithm. It gets written by the same people. It just depends on what fancy graphics it's superimposed onto. So, the different models, the GFS, which is the, is the USA model. I find that model to be very, very accurate. It's normally not in very high resolution, but which means it's not as, it's uh, the time frames, the chunks of time it's written in is, isn't as, as, uh, as frequent as what the AXS, which is the Australian model, or the ECM, which is the European. This one is very good in our winter. In our summer, not so accurate. I find the AXS and the ECM, the European models, are more accurate because they seem to factor in more localised effects in the Southern Hemisphere. The Icon is something that's new that's popped up on Windy. Not convinced about that yet, but it is quite high resolution. Um, and the WRF, if anyone's got running software where you can get grid files, the WRF model is 
very, very good because it does take into account sea breeze and thermal, more, more of that activity than any of the other weather models. But the whole idea is, is we want to look at all the information, like I was saying before, look at all the information and compare all the different models. And then make observations leading up to the, up to the race to refine your opinion on these models. So in looking at the system for the week, having a really good look at just not looking at what the wind's doing, having a look at the general weather. So from here, this is you know, generic of course, but for the for purpose of the presentation, the features that, that, that are here, it's like, yeah, well, there's a trough extending down the west coast, and then there's a low forming, and as we can see, as it gets further on through the week, that low travels south and south, further south and whatever, and plays a big impact of all, all the isobars and the weather that's going to affect our west coast. Understanding trends is important. That's kind of good. The graphic that's, that uh, Wendy uses, uh, sorry, that uh, the bomb uses with Meta is very good in that you can actually look at the trends. And, and again, it's most, the most important thing that I sort of see is pick a time, pick a generic time, like two o'clock in the afternoon or whatever it might be, from day to day to day. And you can see a general trend of like, oh, the trend is throughout the week it starts off a southerly and then each day it goes through, the wind kicks more east, 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 east. That's a trend. So have a look at that as a trend and then compare it to other models. So MedEye is very good at doing that, and the MedEye, their, their resolution is very high for about 48 hours. Anything outside of that, it starts to get a little bit iffy. And the really interesting thing that I'll point out to everybody with BOM is if you're looking at their forecast and you're looking at MedEye, jump over and have a look at the local waters forecast, and you'll swear they are being written by two completely different people. <laughs> And I often look at the computer and just sort of say, look out the window. Because the, the local waters forecast will say absolutely nothing like what the med, what the Medi does. So if you're going to go by anything that bomb produced, I hate this and, this, and I hate people talking about them negatively, but if you're going to do anything with the Bureau of Meteorology, always trust what comes out of Medi and nothing out of what they're looking because the local forecast is written by someone in an air-conditioned office and blacked out windows. <laughs> Meteostar is a very good uh, GFS model. Um, and you can choose, if you go there, a number of different model runs. They're all on drop-downs. And you can, if you choose the Australian New Zealand, and make sure you choose surface winds and uh, MSLP. And from there you'll get to see again general trends, you'll get to see like a low and where it travels to and then you see that there there's a low sort of like moving down, down and there's a rich high pressure coming through that almost gets pushed south because there's a low. And again it's another really good long, long range because sometimes you can get this GFS even though you can see it's very, uh, as the animation goes, it's very chunky because it's low resolution but you can this particular Meteo Star, you can get this two weeks out. So you can actually start looking at Meteo Star and get an idea of what's going to happen for the, the Exmouth race long before any other models can even get there. So at least it gets you looking at stuff. Uh, Windy is very good. A lot of people use it. The most important thing to remember with, Indy, with Windy is choose your model at the bottom right hand corner when you're logging on to have a look at it. And as you then scroll through Windy, you'll be able to see the different resolution because all these pretty graphics will all be nice and smooth when you choose the ECM. Then you go to GFX and they'll be a bit, eh, 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 bit chunky. And then you'll find with the icon, the German model, which is quite high resolution, will only go for three days and then it will stop. Predict win, again, different software, taking the same weather algorithm, imposing, superimposing it onto their their own platform. But again, they've got the ECM and the GFS. And this is what I was saying to you about the resolution. You said they're eight kilometers versus 25. And that just means that you'll find that the, the data that comes through the ECM is just so much richer than what it is through the GFS. But having said that, we need to make sure that we don't discount the GFS. The Americans aren't stupid. Sometimes you might think they are, but they are not stupid. <laughs> And the reason why I say that is, is you know, before, the, before the 98 Hobart, 
there was the ECM model and there was the, AS, the AXS model, the Australian model, and both of them were fairly closely aligned. Like, yeah, the fleet's going to get like Belta and they're going to get like a 35, 40 knot southerly on the first night. And then it'll go to the west and then it'll go to the southwest. So everyone's just got to like bash through it on the first night and it'll be all good. The GFS model showed, showed dead set a cyclone forming on the bash straight. And everybody looked at it and thought, oh, yeah, stupid Americans threw it away. And, their, and the GFS model and their barometric pressures and everything that they forecast was like to the hour accurate. And it, we all know the result is tragedy. But never discount it, and that's why I'm saying it's important to get all the information and analyze it. The other reason it is, we'll get to this later, but it is important to have that information and have it in your pocket or have it in your mind. The other thing to consider is geographical influence and its influence on those weather models. Topography, mountains, hills, the shape of the coast creates friction. This won't be s matter so much to us unless we get a high park in the bite with a really strong easterly flow. Then the topography and the shape of the coast will play quite a big factor in the breezes that we get if it's predominantly offshore. Urban structures and, de uh, structures and development, that'll only be really from here through to, to Hillary's, I would think, but um, the urban heat island is very real and the people who sail a lot on the river will be experiencing that right now, is the sea breezes are behaving differently on the river because of the urban island effect. Vegetation does affect um, the way the breeze interacts because it's moisture in the air and thermal activity is probably the most thing that we're going to experience because the further north we get, we're, we're sailing up to a desert that's inland of us. And so that's going to end up with uh, a lot of convection. And the other thing that will happen is because we're subjected to the Lewin current here, the further north we sail, we will go into warmer water, which uh, will affect the thermal mixing. And without getting too complicated, warm water and cold air, the water of the, the surface of the water heats the air, forces it to rise, which allows it to be replaced very quickly. That's why everyone says in Fremantle the sea breezes are very dense. It's very oh, it's a very dense breeze. Oh, it's, and that's because of thermal mixing. What's it, what's 40 feet up is the same as what's five feet up. It's because the water is actually heating the air and letting it be replaced quickly. That's why easterlies that are hot where, the, where the, uh, the, the air is actually hotter than the sea surface temperature. That's why Eastleys are gusty and the wind moves around a lot. There's no stability because there's no thermal mixing. So important to know, if you've got that little dial on your boat that says sea surface temperature, don't discount it. Uh, the colder the air is, the warmer the water is, the more thermal mixing you get, the better the breeze will be and more stable. The definition of optimal routing we need to also understand is the calculation of your boat speed, where to place it to get you from A to B as quickly as possible. There's no magic, it's just math. The real skill is to find the variance of, on, on the data that you receive and the weather forecast you receive. So if you're using it in a computer, you can see here that's the computer, we put all of our VPP, our boat thing, and knows how fast our boat should be going in this much wind with this sail at this angle. And then we put the weather in and it superimposes it on top of our boat's performance and it goes, oh, okay, where are you going? Okay, you're going there. Oh, you need to go there, then you need to go there, you need to go there, and then you are to finish. That's how you do it in a computer. Old school, you can do the same thing using a map. And if you know that your boat's going to be doing eight knots and you're going to be leaving there in 10 knots of breeze and you because you know your VPP stuff, you can actually plot your course down. And as a new bit of weather comes in, you can plot your course to make, take advantage of that particular weather at any particular time. And as you can see here, you can make a whole set of notes about different changes to the wind or the tide or the current or whatever, but it's all the same. It's just that use this method, you have to use your head in a biro and the other one you can do it with. So some key points. Devise a strategy from your information. Do you want to go on the run line? Do you want to go straight there? Is there better breeze? Will you get there, for, you know, go out further to see where you get there sooner? <coughs> Carefully note the timing variations. The reason I say timing variations is because 
if something happens and you oh, it's supposed to be 20 knots and it's only 10 knots, it's like, well, that, that's a timing variation. So that might change where you go and how you do it and what sales you may select or what heading you may select. Establishing key trigger points in the weather. I think that's a really important one. You can do that with a chart or a map or anything that you want to do. But key trigger points, not just little things, like some key points. And that gives you something. It's, and if you've got them there as a rule, you can sort of say, right, we're three hours away from a trigger point. Let's pay attention to the weather and see what it's doing. I think it's important to establish no-go zones because every race track's got one. You just need to find out where it's going to be at the time based on the forecast. And if you go in there and you end up parked up for 10 hours, then it's your own fault. I guess for a lot of the rally guys, you can just motor on through it, but anyone who's racing, it's not an option. Uh, I think it's, it's really good to establish three what-ifs. Like what if the breeze isn't as windy as what it is or what, what, you know, whatever that might be. And then one what the hell. And I think it's really important to have a one what the hell and that was, it. that was actually, that was the case in the 13 Bali race. Where the Bureau of Meteorology actually stood up here and sort of said, you guys are going to have the most awesome sail north, it's going to be beautiful, you're going to have the wonderful sunsets. And there was this monster load forming, like, you know, three or four hundred miles like in the southwest. And they said, no, you guys are going to be far enough north by the time that event comes there. And then every day we'd have a look at the weather, we'd be like, Jesus Christ, this thing's a monster. What's going to happen here? And then on general leave that year, it was like at 6.30 in the morning when we saw the cloud structure after the sun come up. It's like, right, we're going to get the hell out of here. We were on the run line, we were quite close in to Northwest Cape, and it was like, we need to tack over, we need to start on starboard away from Bali as far and as long as we possibly can. We sailed on starboard tack away from it, 100 miles offshore. And at 6 o'clock that night, it did. It was so far north. It was, it was, it was a monster. So um, that was a definite calling BS on the data. Um, but you need to be able to do that. And you need to be flexible and adapt. So establishing key trigger points, like I was saying before. And these are three trigger points. Again, it doesn't matter if it's on a map or on a computer. The, the computer doesn't do this for you. This is something that you do manually. But there's three trigger points. And it's like, you know, when we, if we've started off free mammal today, it would have been sailing along in a nice, breeze around the 190, 200. Then the breeze starts to starts to uh, go back to the southeast and starts to lift us. Now it'd be easy to take the the, the low rank low low hanging fruit and jive over, but suddenly you'd end up you know in at the Abrolhos and in at Geraldton and, and then with nowhere to go with well, the breeze still bending. So obviously the computer's telling us to to go a lot further out until the breeze gets to about 170 and then and then to jive over in the 170 and then take that as far as we can until the breeze goes back to 190 and then jive back again. They are three trigger points that I would establish if we were starting the race today. The other thing, if we're starting the race today, the no-go zone is in off Carnarvon and this whole area here was just a vortex of no wind. Absolutely not a sausage. So I'd be avoiding that at all costs. Again, that was just based off today. Have we got any questions before I move on to crew management? I know that's a lot of information to sort of... Just you. <laughs> <laughs> if you keep up. <laughs> as, I, as I said, there's a set of notes that we're happy to send out, um, as long as we've got your details. Uh, on the contact sheets, it'll be a summary of this, so you can't lose it. And honestly, it's not difficult. Just follow it, prepare for it, map it out, get the information and it starts to get really easy. It can actually be a lot of fun planning your journey. Okay, so crew management. Um, I know it sounds simple, but it's so much e easier to run a tidy boat when all the equipment is clearly marked with the crew numbers, testing all the equipment, making sure everybody knows how the equipment works. There's gotta be rules on safety equipment and they have to be clearly defined and that has to rest with someone and it should rest with the owner or the boat captain, full stop. There should be no negotiation on those rules. If someone doesn't feel like wearing a life jacket when it's after dark or doesn't want to clip on or whatever, you should establish that now 
and helpfully suggest that maybe it's best they don't join you for the race. That should not be negotiable. Little things, uh, make sure before the sun sets, PDS and belt packs go on. Set a wind limit for the full kit. Like if it starts blowing 30 knots and it's the middle of the day, it's a good time to put all your stuff on. It doesn't have to be night time. There can be a wind limit. Each boat needs to set their own limit and each boat's configured differently. But again, it should be a, uh, a clearly defined set of rules. There should also be clipping on rules and each boat should define those. Um, at night, I would, say, I would suggest that it's a, it's a no-brainer to clip on and I'd say anything over 20 knots at true wind speed and you should be clipped on. And then we've got like the fatal slip. And the reason why I'm just pointing out the fatal slip, it's not the fatal slip of someone falling overboard, but it could, and I'll just point out something that happens, and I've seen it happen before, and I've stopped it immediately. So people go off watch, and they go to go downstairs, and they take their kid off. It's a nice night, it's nine o'clock at night, they've just, they finished their watch, it might only be 10 or 15 knots of breeze. They go down, take their wet weather gear off, take their safety gear off, take off their PLB and their, 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 and their, their, their GPS, all their safety kits off, and they're just getting ready, you know what, I just need to have a wee. Then they come out of the hatch and walk towards the back of the boat. It's like, where are you going? I'm just going, you're just going to what? You're just going to get back down in the hole, and if you want to come back on the deck, you can put all your shit on again. And I know it sounds funny, but again, it's those rules, because it would be that one time, and nobody wants to go through that. So that discipline is what I'd strongly suggest that everybody puts onto a boat. So safety equipment, this is just a quick run through. Personal EPIRB, personal AOS, uh, safety cutter to cut yourself off a tether. If you do go overboard, you're being dragged sideways through the water and you, you, get, you can't breathe. Or in the event of a rollover and you get trapped. Uh, glow sticks are always great to try and um, uh, if someone needs to come back and recover you, and a torch is always great, but having a bum bag with all your stuff on it is no brain. It's, don't mind about what it costs, this, how much is your life worth. Going on to the watch systems, we try and distribute expertise across the watches. Most importantly, to have a watch captain. The reason why it's important to have a watch captain is the watch captain can decide, other than the basic rules, even if it's daytime, they can sort of say, right, breeze above 20 knots, everyone go down one at a time, everyone down, put the stuff on. End of story. What the watch captain says goes. He will define the rules. And you need to have someone in, like, democracy in an emergency does not work. You need to contigue, uh, consider fatigue and sickness. The duration of the watches, that's an individual thing. Rotate the watch times to a different time of the day, if possible. And that's something to remember, and that depends on what sort of rotation you're doing. But it can be pretty boring if you're running longer watches and people go down and they're always got the night shift. Um, the, briefing, uh, the briefing discipline between watches is probably one of the things that's underrated the most. And that is why if a watch starts at a certain hour, the rule has to be, you you wake up and you start getting dressed a quarter to that hour and you come up for at least a five minute briefing with the person you're tapping out before they go down and before you get on because they can say, hey, you know, this has been really tricky and I've, it's been hard to steer at this angle because of this sea state or the, the main keeps flapping or, or this is the way we've trimmed the boat or whatever. You can get three or four, whatever the previous watch has done, you can get all that intelligence in a summary of five minutes. And that's really important to share that knowledge instead of just throwing someone under the bus, right, I'm off, see ya. So, the time to hand over. The other thing that's important is respecting the off-watch team. And I see this quite a lot on some undisciplined race boats, where you get some guys and they work their tail pipes off, then they go downstairs. They've only just got de-kitted and just, uh, just in their wraps. And the next thing you know, they're being woken up. Oh, have, you, have you seen the this? Or do you know what happened there? Or well, if we're thinking about Maybe swapping to that sale, that's, that's poor discipline. You need to respect the off-watch team and try and let them get their rest because that is good fatigue management. 
And a good example of a watch system is the 3x3x3x3. Three by three by three by three. So you have three people on deck sailing the boat, you have three people on standby ready to assist those people to sail the boat when they need it, and you have three people downstairs asleep, and you do that for three hours at a time. Three hours, it doesn't take long to get into that sort of rhythm. And that's just an example of how you sail like a nine person crew boat. So, managing the team. Yes? yes? Lots of people do it lots of different ways. That's one way of someone coming down to do it. Another way is the watch captain might set his watch and then he will wake his team up and say, guys, we've got 15 minutes to be on deck. Put your gear on. We've got to be out there in 10 minutes because we're going to get a five minute briefing from the team that we're changing over with. But yes, if you send someone down to wake them up, absolutely. So managing the team, really important. And this is just, this is basically how I would be looking at, uh, at uh, if we started a race today. So going around Dayboy, then Fairway, and then at 12 o'clock today, that's when the first watch would go down. So there'd be three people going down. So we'd basically, you see there, eat. Right, so we'd have lunch. So bust the rolls out, have something to eat, watch one goes down. Then at, at, at 1500, it's snack time, and watch two goes down. And you can see there it's how, this is what the great thing is, is that's the true wind direction. That's the true wind speed. You can see from the start in seven knots this morning, and then by uh, three o'clock this afternoon it's 20 knots. And you can see there I've highlighted in yellow. That's a, that's a sail change. You can see the sail here, it's masthead zero, then we're going to an A4. So pretty good time when watch two comes up, have all hands on deck, do the sail change, have a roll, then they go off watch. The red you know, are triggers. Remember I said before about establishing those trigger points? That's a trigger point. This trigger point is the breeze has been after it. I mean, I know there's a bit of fapping around the start, but it sort of settles in 190. The red, that's a 10 degree shift. The next one is another 10 degree shift. The next one is another 10 degree shift. So you can see there over the course of that, the trend is for the breeze to be going from the southwest to the south to the southeast, sort of almost. Uh, by 30 degrees, and that will affect, might affect the, the configuration of the boat, the sails you use, whatever that might be. But as you can see, if you actually get the weather up and the boat and know what sails or configuration you're going to be using, it's then very easy to sort of say, well, right, so if it's going to be a three and three or a four or whatever watch system that you think is going to be right for your boat, you can sort of say, right, there's the lunch, there's the snack at three, and then at six o'clock, that's a great time to have dinner, because on, again, it's on a watch change. So the, the team that are coming up to be on watch can come up with their safety stuff on, while dinner's being prepared, and then there might be a shed, I'll put a sked in there or something like that, and that might be a time you choose to charge your batteries, run your motor, do whatever you want to do. But if everybody knows that that's what the setup is, then it's organised. And then there's the watch change, and then we go through to 9 o'clock at night, where there's a snack, and then there's midnight, which is another snack with a watch time. And you'll see here, it's always with a watch change. And it's so you don't, there's nothing worse than when you're downstairs in a boat, and there's people rummaging around looking for food. You've only been asleep for an hour, and it wakes you up. It's not fair. So having some structure will always work. So this is the way of gaining some structure and then all the way through to the finish of the race, of which in this case it was like, okay, the watch three is the last to do it at breakfast, and then we're into the finish of the race. So in terms of the provisioning, check the dietary requirements before you go, especially if you've got any fussy eaters on, as part of your crew, really important to identify that. Uh, plan every meal and timing, as you've seen from the, from the, the last slide, if you're rehydrating food like freeze dried or anything like that, do it carefully. There's nothing worse because if you don't properly rehydrate it with enough time, 
it rehydrates in people's stomachs and makes them really sick. Uh, there's an easy way to uh, freeze dried fruit can be a bit boring, so if you are using freeze dried fruit, there's a great way to make it taste better, and that's add some Tabasco and some other bits and pieces that can uh, spice it up a little bit. That's to individual taste and can be added to crew requirements. Um, allow adequate time to prepare and eat before sunset. So as you saw before, if it was a six o'clock meal time, that'd be a great time. You can even you know, start preparing the food at five o'clock so that when the watch comes up, you can eat together. Um, I always like to pre-pack the snacks and label them for snack one, snack two, snack three, and have it in a bag. <coughs> And then again, it's because like every time it comes time for one of those snacks, the bag of snacks comes up and in it is enough muesli bars or sugar or whatever you decide might be in there that stops people ferreting through all this rubbish downstairs. Whereas you have the one snack pack and if it doesn't all get eaten, it can leave on deck in a rope bag or something like that, it'll get eaten. But, and it also allows you then, before you even start the race, to actually lay it all out and sort of say, we've got enough food for what we think is going to be three or four or five days of sailing, and then put a little bit on the top. Or just, so I'm adding to that comment with labeling the bags and getting the bags on deck. The bags on deck also act as a, a good rubbish management as well. Yep, so good you, point. You tear the packets, eat it, put the rubbish back in the bag like water in bags. It's good rubbish management. Yep, yep, good point, Mike, thank you. Um, don't forget gas lines and forks. <laughs> yeah, our beloved boss on the Indian decided he was going to go on the, the white Nazi program once, and um, we ended up eating cold noodles on a race and using our sun, the arms of our sunglasses as eating utensils. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we all let him know about it. <laughs> Avoid food poisoning, really important. Like if, if, if you've got stuff that's cold and that comes out to be eaten, don't, um, don't leave it laying around. There's nothing, you don't want, you don't want a food poisoned food poison person on board. And it just, it, it'll destroy them because if you get diarrhea or something like on a boat, forget it, just don't go there. If it's not eaten, throw it away. Any questions from any of that crew management? Yes? That image reminded me of seasickness, actually. The image of the food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They have nothing ticked on that. Seasickness will that come up? On seasickness? Yeah. Uh, that will come up. Absolutely. So we'll touch on that. But, uh... <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah. How do you work out how much food per person per day? Oh. If I'm honest, uh, we, we kind of, we assimilate to a calorie burn yeah. and, uh, and, and just basically do it for, for, by a calorie burn. And what, what, we, we, what we try to do is just have the one hot meal on a day because it just limits the amount of fuss and then keep all the other stuff as like pre-packed or, or, or ready to go. And, unless, and then we'll take extra of the rehydration food like the freeze dried or whatever because if the, if the race ends up being a lot longer than what you anticipate, unless you've got refrigeration on board, it's no good to you anyway, naturally. So we would sort of allow for another two days of food before we would then go into like ration stuff. But What do you use on Indian for say your hot meal versus your snacks? Uh, like on a hot meal we do, we do freeze dried every time. Yep. Yeah, just because it's so easy to make and it's easy to feed a team of 10. Yeah. Uh, and it can be a little bit boring, but by the numbers, it's got all the calories that everybody needs to give them a good foundation. And then um, we do other, we have, do have some protein snacks. Uh, we do, we, we, te we tend to carry some fresh fruit and some rolls and some basic rolls. And, you know, after it gets to two days, they're no good for anything. Sure. Then, then we're going on to pre-packaged stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Waste management. I know Thank that on any long passages that we've done, we've reduced all our packaging that we take with us. So any unnecessary boxes, labels, would all be removed so that we didn't take them. Because I know in particular with racing, you're not allowed for anything to go on the side, even if you put lucky bands on the kites, 
we had to stop that because we couldn't drop a lucky band over the side. So one of the important things is, I think, dealing with the waste. One way is to minimise what you take with you, and the other one is to prepare for the storage of your waste as well, so that you can dispose of it, your recycling and your other waste that has to go into the landfill. Yeah, good point. It's, it's, it's actually a very good point. And any of that pre-packaged stuff that we take on a race boat, we normally break it down before we leave the dock and it goes into just the singular packs of the, all the cardboard and all the other rubbish. We do separate a lot of it out. Okay, so I'll keep moving on to adverse weather. <coughs> it's interesting that um, looking at this slide, it brings back quite a few memories. This is the 15 or the 16 Hobart, I think. But that was another southerly that they said, yeah, it'll get to about 30 knots. And it was 45. But this, this particular one was a, was a year where everybody knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of timing. And we always had a, had a strategy that as soon as we thought that we were within an hour or half an hour of doing it, is we would set the boat up for the next nearly 48 hours of punishment. And, um, and that wasn't just configuring the boat into the, the reefs and the storm gym and everything else, but that was making sure the crew had like had, had their last hot meal they were going to have for two days, uh, making sure that the, the, the boat was stowed downstairs properly, were prepared for, for, from everything. And so on this particular night, it was about 8 o'clock at night, we're off the New South Wales coast, quite deep down, and the breeze was dropping all the time, and, and at that point I'd sort of made the call and I said, well, you know, there's, there's probably only two or three miles to hemorrhage here if we just stop dead. So let's stop dead, get a nice fold on the, on the, on the spinnaker, a nice fold on the jibs, get, get the main set up all nicely, get the storm jib out, make sure everyone's the boat's properly bedded down and when this thing hits, it'll just hit. And so we got all that done and then we waited for about 15, 20 minutes and then this thing just bang, it just came in. It started at 30 and then built to 40 and then went to 45, close to 50. On that particular night, there were 35 boats, I think 32 or 35 boats that retired with broken sails because they did no prep. They basically sailed up to the southerly, it hit, and then there was a mad scramble to get everything done. And mainsails were in millions of pieces and they all ended up sailing back to Sydney. So the net gain to us was, at that point, uh, going across Bass Strait, we're actually the overall uh, lead boat uh, for the race. And I attribute that to um, most of the prep that we did before the actual storm hit. So in preparation, it's really with adverse weather, brief the whole crew, everybody has to know what's happening. Seasickness prevention, which was your point earlier, thank you for making that. The biggest thing to remember with seasickness is, is that if you wait until someone's sick to treat them, it's too late. If it's gonna get bumpy, Try and get that person that you know is vulnerable to seasickness to take on some fluid and to take on some food and to take some medicine. At least an hour or two hours. And then for the and then get them to maintain that level of treatment. That's the most important thing. Once people go down, it's very, very hard to come back. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. What position on the boat is best? Oh, once they're crooked, nowhere. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's, just, it's just, it's so horrible. This, the, the, uh, do you get sick? No. You're, you're lucky. I mean, neither do I, but I've had people describe it to me about how it feels, and they'd rather be dead. It's, it's, and and, and they, they want air, but they can't be on deck, and, and it's, so being downstairs is no good, but... You can't, this is the other thing I'll bring up right now, is you can't have, a, if someone's thrown up but they're okay, that's not such a bad thing. But if someone is sick, they want to lay down in the cockpit, they're a liability. If something happens in the boat, it's too easy for them to get into trouble. The last thing you need to do is then put the rest of the crew at risk because you've got a sick person's gone up and been swept overboard because they don't, they, they aren't functioning. So, as much as it hurts them, send them downstairs with a bucket. It's the only place for them. And it might not be kosher for the racing guys, but 
if you do have someone down, it happens that they're on the leeward side or not the right side of the boat for boat speed. As long as your racing guys can continue to function around them, they're the ones that are going to carry the sick ones. So stuff them wherever. As long as they've got their bucket and lots of water so the moment they're feeling better and they can actually hold the water in, it's a good time to get more medicine into them. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, making sure the safety equipment is organised downstairs for adverse weather because you still will be running watches and it's important when people come on and off of deck that their safety equipment is 100%. Brief early, like I was saying before. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid to set your boat up way early. Um, because trying to reef and furl and do all these things when it's too late is just hard. It, it's so fatiguing and it always leads to a breakage or something like that. Anticipate reef early and set it up. Set your boat up at night for minimum risk sailing too. And that's what I was saying about the polar data. It doesn't matter if, if your boat's not sailing at 100%, it's sailing at 90%, but everybody's rested and everyone's comfortable, no one's fatigued and you haven't broken anything and the boat's not out of control. Sometimes that's a good thing because those average numbers are going to be better in the long run. On deck preparation, tidy boat, it's a no-brainer but it has to be said. And below deck preparation, really important to make sure that all the essentials are there. Like if it's really rough and you are reef and someone needs an extra jacket, it should be hanging in their hook or in their pigeonhole. And, and if someone needs food, it should be, you know, be able to get a food pack. Storm sails, again, like I was saying, prepare early and know how it works, especially uh, for a lot of, like, uh, some of the, some of the uh, more specialised storm gear, like, especially for the stuff that goes over top of furling edsels, you need to know how it works, because time can be of the essence there. And knowing where they sheet is super, super important too, and you need to be able to do this with plenty of time so that when you go to execute, everything is set up perfectly. In terms of sail repairs, the most common failure and sail repairs on a race like this, number one is replacing slides and luff hardware. They're always the things that break. It happens when you crash jive or while you're reefing or something happening. So always make sure you've got spares of that. Spreader patches, spreaders are always poking in the sails when you're running downwind. Make sure you've got spreader patches. Trauma due to excess flapping, it happens, particularly, again, while you're reefing. So when you're reefing, the more you practice it, the better you get at it, then there's less trauma to the sail by excessive flapping. Uh, chafing when reefed can be a bit of a problem. Battens coming loose and breaking is a problem. If anyone's got sails that have got Velcro that hold the sails in, make sure you hand stitch them in before you leave. Because if you do get a blow and they do flap, they'll be straight out the back. Uh, breaking the mainsail due to reef line failure. That's another thing that uh, is really important to... What we do is we don't put eyelets in the sails so that you can then pass a rope through to tidy up the reef. The reason why we don't do that is, is if a clutch lets the reef line go or if the reef line breaks, the boom will go down, the sail will go up, and the entire sail will just unzip itself right across that line. It's most important that you set this up properly, and that's why we put webbing tabs on the outside of the sail, so you can tie it from one tab to the other, and if that happens, it will tear the tab off of the sail, but you will not tear the sail in half. Uh, leech line failure, again, particularly in Genoa's, if the Genoas don't have proper covers over where the leech lines and the leech line cleats are. When the sail's flapping or tacking, more often than not, the sail will unzip itself up the leech because the leech line catching on something as, as it goes past the mast. And the other one is delamination, and that's for laminate type sails. And if they flap too much, they will. There's only so much work that glue can do before it lets go. So, Paul, just mm. talking about how you're reefing the mainsail, mm. you're going to round the boom, eh? Only on, if you don't have lazy jacks or a lazy bag, and, and you need to, the sails being reefed and down and the sails dropping down, you want to tidy it up with those little, like a lot of boats have little eyelets. Yeah, but you meant to not go around the boom. Well, you can oh. go around the boom, but, if, but as, long as, as long as you're not going through the sail, you can go round under the boom, but only to the webbing tab on one side of the sail, to the webbing tab on the other side of the sail. I always thought that all of those, the 
those Pringles in the sale, mm. we're not, they're not load taking. So you only have to have sale supporting them. That's not, right. Not a, not a spa. Yep, that's right. It's not supposed to, it's not supposed to go under a spa. Yeah. But it happens. You've and I've seen that happen. You've got a vault right here. I enjoy it's real. Yeah, I mean it shouldn't be it shouldn't be going under, but once you've got a lot of sail, like in second or third reef, there's a lot of sail there to try and contain. So, yeah, and if you've got a bot, if you, if, you, if your if your sail's connected to the boom along the foot, then you don't have a choice. But again, I always prefer to have the tabs on there because I'd always prefer if something happened then that, that it was the tabs that tear off. I don't actually like having anything going through the sail at all. Um, so, in the sail repair kit, some Dacron tapes, good seam ripper, some needles, some wax thread, an owl, if you don't know what an owl is, one of those like spike things that you see in a sail lot that really sharp and long. Uh, hand stitching palm, some insignia, which is commonly known as sticky back. That's fantastic if the sail is salt free and, uh, and dry. If the sail is wet and it's got salt on it, it's absolutely hopeless. Um, so have some scissors, and the reason why it's like hopeless is if you're not using that, then you're better off with some Dr. Sales. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the product. It's very good. It's a flexible epoxy. It looks like five-minute arrow dye. It comes in a little tube the same. So you squeeze it out, you, you whip it together, and then if you've got a bit of patch or a bit of Dacron tape or anything, you can then just put it on. You can put it on wet, soaking wet. You can put it on salty, and it will fix a hole. Um, it's useless if you don't have any cough. You can always use your pipe cots or some of your furniture from downstairs, but I'm sure the crew wouldn't be very happy, so take some spare material. Some other stuff for more permanent and bigger repairs. The 3M5200 Fast Cure is a flexible urethane adhesive, just like sort of Sikaflex, but I find this stuff actually better. Um, you can just about stick anything down to a sail using that and repair it. I always like to have some 3M spray glue because that can make stuff like Insignia stick extra good just by spraying that down to a sail before putting it on. A roll of 2.5 millimeter Dyneema cord is just invaluable because you can lash, you can, you can poke a hole in your sail with your owl and you can lash anything around it and it will do the job of, it's the, the sales version of gaffer tape. So it's, it's, it's your, your go-to bit. And then making sure that you've got slides, cars, batten pockets, pins, and lights and stuff. And the only thing that I'd say there in amongst the, uh, is if you've got, um, a bit like I was saying about the battens with sewing in the, the Velcros, if you've got those. Um, if you've got batten pockets, batten luff boxes that have got tensioners on them, like if the leech of your, your mainsail's closed and you, you tension the battens through the, the luff boxes at the front, Make sure you put some Loctite on them before you start the race. A big race like that with lots of uh, rattling, and they can actually, I've seen them actually come out and drop on the deck. So going on to planning for the unexpected. Observations will be your biggest clue as to what comes next. Gather as much information as you can. And that's eyes out of the boat stuff. If you see a lump of clouds coming at you, and if it looks like a duck and it starts quacking, you know what it's going to be. Preparation will determine the decision you make. And if you've addressed that preparation and all the items that have been in this presentation, then it will be an easy decision because you will say at that point, like, things aren't really going that, that well with the weather right now, but we, we're prepared for this and we know the boat needs to be configured like this, this and this, and we can organise our crew, we can organise our food, and this is going to be our new course and we're going to sail on this tack for another three or four hours and then we're going to tack over and do another one. And practice will play the biggest part in that execution, making sure that the crew know exactly what to do. But also make the journey less stressful and prevent in injury and damage to the equipment. And you've got to make sure that everyone is aware of those onboard procedures. So in conclusion, monitor the weather for the entire week before the start of the race. So you've got a global view of what you think is going to happen. Create a best guess strategy and map everything out. Whether you do it on a computer, whether you bring out a chart, map it out. Have a look at your boat speed, where you think you're going to be at each part of the race course and how you think your boat is going to be configured at that point. Then share that plan with your team. Don't let anyone fly blind. Make sure that everybody knows. Know your boat 
and also make sure the crew knows all the SAR configurations and crossovers. That includes where the jib cars go and what all the other settings you might have. The other thing that's really important is to measure the conditions against your forecast. And I've said that before and I'll say it again. If you've got a forecast and you're expecting 25 knots and it's only 10, or you're expecting 10 and it suddenly goes to 25, you need to be asking the question, why? And what is that going to play out for the next six or 12 hours? Because that will make a big change in adapting your strategy based on those measurements and those observations that you've got. Whereas flying blind expecting the forecast to be accurate, I hate to say it, but it very rarely is. <coughs> Manage crew fatigue, really important. Um, once people are tired, um, they just can't do the task. And, you, and you know, every boat needs, needs, needs a team, and by managing that, you can keep everyone going. If it is going to be bad weather, we've said it before, prepare early <coughs> for it, because then you'll feel more comfortable. The other thing in preparing early for bad weather <coughs> is it plays a huge part on the psychology of everybody on board. If people feel comfortable, they're not afraid, and if they're not afraid, they don't tend to get as sick. And that's really important in the, in the fighting with fatigue. The most important thing, I've said it once, I've said it again for this whole thing, is if you stay disciplined, then you know, you'll always be safe. But it's important to maintain that discipline. So, any done. questions? <coughs> yes. Paul, I guess, I mean, you saw the storm jib there, I think, and uh, putting it over a, a felt head sort of thing. Yes. Didn't really say anything about uh, a storm tri sail or such, but I, I'm guessing that you're, you're a supporter of, say, reefing the main 50% rather than trying to fly a storm uh, tri sail. Would that be right? 100,000 million percent. <laughs> 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 there, is, there, is, there is no. There is no justification why I think a boat that's going offshore shouldn't have the ability to reef 50% of their luff length instead of trying to secure a sail to a boom and then taking an independent sail forward to then independently plug it onto a rig is a, is a big call to the human resource department on a boat when you can just pull two strings and, and end up with something of the same area up is to me uh, a, a complete no-brainer. Just on yes, that, do you carry a tricep? Do you carry a tricep no, as well? No. So if you break your boom and it's unfixable, yep. what's your plan? Third reef straight just... to the aft corner. Oh, okay, so you just yeah. use that as a tricep. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and honestly, this all came out. I had, a, I had an argument without boring anyone. I had an argument with Yachting Australia about five years ago. I said, Europe's been doing this for ages, especially the big multi hulls. They're allowed to sail a race without a tricycle. Oh, but it's different because they've got luff cars and they're short handed and the sails are so big. I'm like, and? Like, it's, it's, no, it's no different. And it, and it was laughable how at the start of a Hobart you'd have to go out and put a tricycle up. You see all these, all these boats going to put up these sails that would never, so that would survive five minutes in 50 knots. But it was all part of the, the show that it was totally impractical and was never going to work. And it wasn't until Yachting Australia agreed to make that 50% luff leak. Now, you know, all the mainsails have got 50% reefs on and people are using them. Whereas before that, they just tie the mainsails to the boom and sail under a storm gym with nothing else up. Yeah. At the start of the Hobart, we put our price to luff upside down. <laughs> <laughs> did they notice? Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so did the people immediately around us. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Okay, once again, I'll just remind you, if you want a set of notes and a summary from this evening, make sure we've got your details. Um, outside of that, thanks very much. Um, I hope to see, I hope we make it to Exmouth first. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I hope to see everyone else, and I hope to see everyone else in Exmouth too, sail safe.